think. Okay, so now we will learn about the high seas and uh, the provisions under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, Merriam's Dictionary defines the high seas. I just wanted to imagine the high seas, and you can see the small picture there. By now, you would understand what are the high seas. So, uh, Merriam's Dictionary defines the high seas as the open part of the sea or oceans, especially outside the territorial waters. The free dictionary, there's a spelling error there. It's F-R-E-E. -E. Free dictionary defines high seas as the open waters of an ocean or a sea beyond the limits of territorial jurisdiction of a country. Next is uh, the high seas as defined in Britannica, high seas in maritime law in all parts of the mass is all parts of the mass of salt water surrounding the globe that are not the part of a territorial sea or interna internal waters of a state. So thereby high seas are the portion of open seas which are beyond the territorial waters or beyond the jurisdiction of any state. Now, chapter seven of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, it deals with high seas that are part. Article 65 mentions about management and conservation of marine mammals in the high seas like whales and all that. So as per the article 86, high seas encompass all parts of the sea that are not included in the exclusive economic zone. Last class, we learned about the demarcations. Is, uh, the, the parts of the sea that are not included in the EEZ or the exclusive economic zone in the territorial sea or in the internal waters of the state or in the archipelagic waters of an archipelagic state. Now, Article 88. So what chapter of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea talks about high seas? It is Chapter 7. So apart from that, uh, which are the articles? It begins with uh, Article 80. Six onwards, 86, 88, 89. Apart from that, even 65 talks about the management and conservation of marine mammals in the high seas. So marine mammals example is whales, sea lions, and so on. So Article 88 specific, specifically entails peaceful use of high seas to the extent that it emphasizes the need of the high seas to be reserved for peaceful use or to be used for peaceful purposes. So it simply says that high seas should be used for peaceful purposes. Then Article 89 enumerates or lays down that no state or nation can claim sovereignty over the high seas. That is, no one can claim um, sovereignty or kind of ownership over the high seas. No country can say that the high seas belongs to them. So that's what Interestingly, Article 89 speaks about no ownership or no sovereignty or no country can claim its sovereignty uh, over the high seas. This is a very important article, Article 89 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the High Seas. This is an important article and all these articles must form a part of your answer what we're going to discuss today. However, 89 is a very important article that you must write. It is... Article 89 says that no state or a nation can claim sovereignty over the high seas because it does not belong to any country. Next is Article 87 is a foundational article of Chapter 7 of United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, which deals with the freedom of high seas. And it states that the high seas are open to all states, whether coastal or landlocked. And freedom of high seas is exercised under the conditions laid down by this convention and by other rules of international law. So it comprises inter alia both for coastal and landlocked states. That is freedom of navigation. It talks about freedom of overflight. Just in the last uh, chapter, we learned about the freedom of navigation. Then it talks about freedom to lay submarine cables and pipelines. Then uh, freedom to construct artificial islands and other installations permitted under international law, freedom of fishing, freedom of scientific research, and so on. So these freedoms shall be exercised by all states, all countries, with due regard to the interests of other states as well. So in their exercise of freedom, that is, while they are enjoying the freedom of high seas, they must give due regard to the interests of other states, follow the rules of the other states as well, with, and you know enjoy it however be within the ambit of law and the convention 
that is the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Now, Article 90 speaks about the right of navigation. Before that, we spoke about the freedom of navigation, 89. And 90 talks about the right of navigation. And it says that every state, whether coastal or landlocked, has a right to sail ships flying its flag on the high seas. So Article 91 deals with the nationality of ships. So every state shall fix the conditions for the grant of its nationality to ships, for the registration of ships in its territory, and for the right to fly its ships. Ships have the nationality of the state whose flag they're entitled to fly. And there must exist a genuine link between the state and the ship. So every state shall issue two ships to which it has granted the right to fly its flag documents to that effect. So that means every ship has to have the, the, the flag of the country to which it belongs to and the flag documents it must carry, um, I mean, in the ship, that uh, all relevant documents which speaks about to the, uh, speaks about the nationality and the registration of that particular ship and from which territory or from where it has come or, uh, you know, to which country it belongs to. Next is Article 92 talks about the status of ships. Ships shall sail under the flag of one state only and, and in exceptional cases expressly it's provided for in international treaties or in this convention shall be subject to its exclusive jurisdiction on the high seas. A ship may not change its flag during a voyage or while in a port of call in the case, however, in case of real transfer of ownership or ch change of registry, it may be able to do so. That means, except in case of real transfer of ownership or change of registry, only then, in this exceptional circumstances, it can change the flag of that of the, uh, the 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 flag that it carries. Apart from that, it should never change the flag. Uh, you know, during a voyage except under two circumstances where there is real transfer of ownership while it is in the voyage or there is change of registry or registration. So a ship that sails under the flags of two or more states using them according to convenience may not claim any of the nationalities in question with respect to any other states and may be assimilated to a ship without nationality. So Article 93 talks about ships flying the flag of United Nations organization. So there are ships that may fly the flag of the UNO, its specialized agencies, and the International Atomic Energy Agency, which, and of course, even they need to comply with the preceding provisions as well. That is, during a voyage, the flag of the ship should not be changed, except in two circumstances where the ownership has changed and the registry has changed. Next is Article 94. It talks about the duties of the flag state. What are the duties of the state? to which a particular ship belongs or a particular ship uh, you know carries the flag of a particular state as belonging to that particular state so what is the duty of the flag so every state shall effectively exercise its jurisdiction and control in administrative technical and social uh, matters over ships flying its flag in particular every state shall maintain a register And uh, it should maintain a register of ships containing the names and particulars of ships flying its flag, except those which are excluded from generally accepted international regulations on account of their small size. And assume jurisdiction under its internal law over each ship flying its flag and its master, officers and crew in respect of administrative, technical and social matters concerning the ship. So every ship. Every state shall take such measures for ships flying its flag as are necessary to ensure safety of sea with regard to, say, construction, equipment and seaworthiness of ships, the manner of ships, labor condition, training of crews, the use of signals, maintenance of communication systems, avoiding accidents or prevention of collisions and so on. So such measures should include those necessary to ensure that each ship before registration and thereafter at appropriate intervals is surveyed by a qualified surveyor of ships and as on board such charts, nautical publications and navigation 
equipment and instruments as appropriate for the safe navigation of the ship so that each ship is in charge of a master and officers who's, who possess appropriate qualifications, in particular in seamanship, navigation, communications, and marine engineering, and that the crew is appropriate in qualification and number for the type, size, machinery, and equipment of the ship. That means those who are on board, the officers on board the ship, who are in charge of the ship must be well qualified and possess necessary marine qualifications that are necessary. Further, that the master officers and to the extent appropriate, the crew are fully conversant with and are required to observe the applicable international regulations concerning the safety of life at sea, the prevention the prevention of collisions, that is accidents, the prevention, reduction, and control of marine pollution, and the maintenance of communications by radio. In in taking the measures called for in paragraph three and four, each state is required to conform or abide to generally uh, accepted international regulations, procedures, and practices, and to take any steps which may be necessary to secure their observance. A state which has clear grounds to believe that proper jurisdiction and control with respect to a ship have not been exercised may report the facts to the flag state. Upon receiving such a report, the flag state shall investigate the matter and, if appropriate, take any action necessary to remedy the situation. Next is, each state shall cause an inquiry to be held by or before a suitably qualified person or persons for every marine casualty or incident. Suppose there is an accident or there is some kind of an incident that takes place so that it must be uh, investigated by a qualified person okay so whether it's an incident or accident which takes place on the high seas which involves a ship flying its flag and causes loss of life or serious injury to nationals of another state or serious damage to ships or inst installations of another, another state or to the marine environment then it should be inquired by a suitably qualified person. That is, this is a question of accidents or any incidents, you know, on the high seas. So the flag state and the other state shall cooperate in the conduct of an inquiry held by that other state into any such marine casualty or incident of navigation. Next, Article 95 talks about immunity of warships on the high seas. That means they are immune to certain things. They are guaranteed as against the jurisdiction of any other state other than the flag state. Then uh, 96 talks about immunity of ships used only on government and non-commercial services. That is, they enjoy complete immunity from the jurisdiction of uh, any state, from the jurisdiction of any state other than the flag state. 97 talks about penal jurisdiction in matters of collision, that is, accidents or any other incident of navigation. That is, in case there is a collision or there is a, a kind of an accident which in, in on the high seas and that, you know, incident or accident, it involves a penalty or, you know, or a, a disciplinary responsibility or poses a disciplinary responsibility of the master of ship or of any other person in the service of the ship, no penal uh, or disciplinary proceedings may be instituted against such person except before the judicial or administrative authorities either of the flag state or of the state of which such person is a national next is like what they're trying to say here is uh, think of the, uh, a situation where there is an accident on the high seas suppose there is a sh accident or a ship that involves in, the ac in, in an accident so what they're trying to say here is but if at all such an incident takes place, then no penalty or punishment or disciplinary proceeding should be initiated against whom? Against the master of the ship or any person who might have caused such a problem, except before the judicial authorities or administrative authorities of the flag state. That means the, the state to which the ship belongs. How do you know to which state or country the ship belongs? It's carrying the flag of that particular state or that particular country. So looking at the flag, they would know that to which country the ship belongs to. 
So what they're saying is, now, if there is an accident on the high sea, then who will come and investigate and who will punish the wrongdoer? On the high sea, because high sea belongs to nobody. So who is going to punish? Who is going to initiate disciplinary proceeding? So the answer to that is the country to which the ship belongs to or the country to which the person is a national of. For example, a person is a national of UK, United Kingdom, and he is a master of the ship. He's a captain of the ship. And because of him, there is an accident. So then he will be charged under the laws of his particular country. If the ship belongs to, say, some other country, say, which country you want to say? Some other country, any other country, for example. Say it belongs to, you know, Somalia. So it, it, it has, uh, you know, moved to the high seas and there's, God forbid, there is a kind of a problem. And then who, like the, then who will, uh, you know, uh, punish the person who has caused such an accident? So it would be Somalia because the ship belongs to Somalia. So it's like that. So then in disciplinary matters, the state or the country which has issued a master certificate or a certificate of competence or license shall alone be competent after due legal process. That is, you have to follow particular procedures of law to pronounce the withdrawal of such certificates, even if the holder is not a national of the state which issued them. Further, there should be no arrest or detention of the ship, even as a measure of investigation shall be ordered by any authorities other than those of the flag state. A duty to render assistance. Every state shall require the master of the ship flying its flag in so far as he can do so without serious danger to the ship, the crew or the passengers to render assistance to any person found at sea in danger of being lost or to proceed with all possible speed to rescue of persons in distress. Okay, now here, what is the question here? The duty of the ships to go and help ships now every state or a country shall require the master of the ship flying its flag in so far as he can do without serious danger to the ship the crew or the passengers to give all his assistance that is render all his assistance to any person found at sea in danger of being lost he can proceed with all possible speed to the rescue of persons in distress, if informed of the need of assistance in so far as such action may be reasonably be expected of him. Now, after a collision or an accident to render assistance, that is to support other ships, its crew, its passengers, and where possible to inform the other ship of the name of his own ship, its post or registry at the nearest port at which it will call. That means in case there is some other accident of some other ship or there is some other ship that is stranded or in examples a danger of drowning example the danger of drowning and so on so the other ship uh, you know should run to its aid and should provide all possible assistance that it can so every coastal state shall promote the establishment operation and maintenance of an adequate and effective search and rescue service regarding the safety on and over the sea and where circumstances so require by way of mutual Re regional arrangements cooperate with neighboring states for this purpose. So Article 99, prohibition of the transport of slaves. Now, every state shall take effective measures to prevent and punish the transport of slaves in ships authorized to fly its flag and to prevent the unlawful use of its flag for that purpose. So any slave taking refuge on board any ship, whatever its flag, shall ipso facto be free. Next is Article 109, unauthorized broadcasting from the high sea. So all states shall cooperate in the suppression of unauthorized broadcasting from the high seas. For the purpose of this convention, unauthorized broadcasting means the transmission of sound radio or television broadcast from a ship or installation on the high seas intended for reception by the general public contrary to international regulations but excluding the transmission of distress calls next is any person engaged in unauthorized broadcasting may be prosecuted before the court of the flag state of the ship the state of registry of the installation the state of which the person is a national 
any state where the transmissions can be received or any state where authorized radio communication is suffering interference. So this is with respect to unauthorized broadcasting from the high seas. That means there should be no unauthorized broadcasting of the high seas. That is transmission of sound, radio, or television broadcasts from a ship or installation on the high seas, which is intended for reception by the general public, contrary to international regulations, but excludes the transmission of distress calls. That means they can do broadcasting when it comes uh, to, say, for example, there's an accident again mid-sea. So they can try to connect with people through, you know, sound radio or television and so on, just to communicate, to seek help. But otherwise, unauthorized broadcasting is not permitted. That I mean, without permission, they cannot be broadcasting. Next is right of visit. So except where acts of interference uh, derive from powers conferred by treaty, a warship which encounters on the high seas, a foreign ship other than the ship entitled to complete immunity in accordance with article 95 and 96 is not justified in boarding it unless there is a good reasonable ground for suspecting that the ship is you know engaged in piracy or the ship is engaged in slave trade or the ship is engaged in unauthorized broadcasting in the flag we just saw in the previous article that broadcasting without permission is not permitted uh, i mean it's not allowed so state of the warship has jurisdiction under article 109 and the ship is without nationality or though flying a foreign flag or refusing to show its flag, the ship is in reality of the same nationality as the warship. Now, in the cases provided for in paragraph one, the warship may proceed to verify the ship's right to sail its flag. To this end, it may send a boat under the command of an officer to the suspected ship. If the suspicion remains after the documents have been checked, it may proceed to a further examination on board the ship, which must be carried out with all possible consideration. If the suspicions prove to be unfounded and provided that the ship boarded has not committed any act justifying them, it shall be compensated for any loss or damage that may be sustained. And these provisions apply mutadis mutandis, that means as per changing circumstances or as per the facts and circumstances to that particular you know, event and to a military aircraft as well. So these provisions also apply to any other duly authorized ships or aircraft clearly marked and identifiable as being in government service. Next is the right of hot pursuit. So this might come for you for short note. What is the right of hot pursuit? So the hot pursuit of... Uh, foreign ship may be undertaken when the competent authorities of a coastal state have good reason to believe that the ship has violated the laws and regulations of a state. So such pursuit must be commenced when the foreign ship or one of its boats is within the internal waters, the archipelagic waters, the territorial sea or the contiguous zone or pursuing state and may only be co continued outside the territorial sea or the contiguous zone if the pursuit has not been interrupted. So what happens here is sometimes it might happen that a foreign ship, I mean, has or a ship has violated the laws of another state or another country. So at that time, the uh, the, the foreign ship may be pursued. So there is a hot pursuit of a foreign ship. By whom? By competent authorities of the coastal state. That is, if they have reason that there is violation of a particular law and regulation of their state, so they might pursue this particular ship which has defaulted. Are you understanding me? So it's not necessary that at the time when the foreign ship was within the territorial waters or in the contiguous zone, it received the order to stop moving further. Or, you know, it, it, uh, if the foreign ship is within contiguous zone, so it, it doesn't matter where it is, but the country has got the right of hot pursuit. That is, a uh, pursuing the foreign ship by the competent authorities of a coastal state who have good reason to believe that one particular vessel has violated 
the laws and regulations of that particular country. So again, the right of hot pursuit shall apply mutandis mutandis, that means as the case may be, to violations even in the EZ or in the continental shelf, including the safety zones and so on. So the right of the hot pursuit, it ceases as soon as the ship pursuit enters the territorial sea of its own state or of, or of a third state. So are you understanding this point? If the ship, it moves inside its own territorial boundaries, then they will stop pursuing the ship. Or it goes into the boundary of some other state, then they stop pursuing the ship. Are you understanding me? So this is the right of hot pursuit. Any questions on this? Because this is important. You can get a short note on this. Hot pursuit article 111 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Now, hot pursuit is not deemed to have begun unless the pursuing ship has satisfied itself by such practicable means as may be available that the ship pursued or one of its boats or other craft working as a team and using the ship pursued as a mothership is within the limits of the territorial sea or as a case may be within the contiguous zone or the exclusive economic zone or above the continental shelf. So this pursuit may only be commenced after a visual or auditory signal to stop has been given at the distance which enables it to be seen or heard by the foreign ship. And the right of hot pursuit may be exercised only by warships or military aircrafts or other ships or aircrafts which are clearly marked and identifiable as being on government service and authorized to that effect. So where hot pursuit is affected by an aircraft. So again, the above provisions of paragraph one to four shall apply. Further, the aircraft giving the order to stop must itself actively pursue the ship. until a ship or another aircraft of the coastal state summoned by the aircraft arrives to take over the pursuit, unless the aircraft is itself able to arrest the ship, it does not suffice to justify an arrest outside the territorial sea that the ship was merely cited by the aircraft as an offender or suspected offender. So this is the protocol. So if it was not both ordered to stop and pursued by the aircraft itself or the aircraft or ships, which continue the pursuit without interruption. So now we'll talk about the release of the ship arrested. The release of a ship arrested within the jurisdiction of a state and escorted to a port of the state for the purpose of an inquiry before the competent authorities may not be claimed solely on the ground that the ship in the course of its voyage was escorted across a portion of EEZ or the high seas if the circumstances rendered this necessary. So a very sh where a ship has been stopped or arrested outside the territorial sea in circumstances which do not justify the exercise of the right of hot pursuit, then it shall be compensated for any loss or damage that it might have sustained. So that means if, uh, like, you know, if um, they have wrongfully pursued a ship, and there are no proper reasons to justify the exercise of the right of hot pursuit, then such a loss or a damage that might be caused to that ship, it can be compensated. This is an international law protocol. The right to lay submarine cables under Article 112, they, all states, all countries have got the right to lay submarine cables and pipelines on the bed of the high seas uh, beyond the continental shelf. And again, 79 talks about you know, reasonable measures for exploration of continental shelf. That is, you can extract uh, all natural resources and so on. And um, the coastal state shall not impede the laying or, or stop the laying or maintenance of such cables or pipelines. 
Now, 113 talks about breaking or injury of a submarine cable or pipeline. So in case there is breakage of uh, any submarine cable, which is beneath the high seas, if at all it is done willfully or through culpable negligence, then, of course, uh, you know you know why those pipelines are laid or why those cables are laid. Say telegraph, you know, telephone communication, telephone cables are laid under the water, is high seas. And in case it is, you know, deliberately done, and of course, then it is a punishable offence. So they will punish. It's a punishable offence. Next is breaking or injury by owners of submarine cable or pipeline of another submarine cable or pipeline. So they have certain laws and regulations that are necessary that if, uh, you know, that regulate uh, this aspect as well, that if persons subject to its jurisdiction are owners of submarine cable or pipelines beneath the high sea is laying or repairing the cable or pipeline, they cause a break or injury to another, then they shall bear the cost of repairs. The, the question here is who bears the cost of repairs, the one who, uh, you know, caused such a breakage or uh, of the cable or pipeline. Next is indemnity for loss incurred in avoiding injury to a submarine uh, cable or pipeline. Shall, of course, the person who is causing the loss shall indemnify the owner of the cable or pipeline. But, of course, he has to take precautionary measures uh, before that and it has to be proved that he has taken all precautionary measures and this has just been an accident next is right to fish on the high seas as per article 116 all states have the right for the nationals to engage in fishing of the high seas but of course they are subject to the provisions of their country's treaty obligations and the other uh, rights and duties that are uh, you know enumerated under Article 63, Paragraph 2, and Article 64 and 67 with respect to right of fishing on the high seas as well. Then 117 talks about the duty of the states to adopt national measures for conserving the living resources, that is protection and, uh, you know, protecting the living resources of the high seas. 118 talks about cooperation of the states in the conservation and management of living resources, that is, all countries must cooperate in conserving and managing the living resources in the high seas. Next is conservation of living resources of the high seas under, under Article 119. That is how they would conserve the living resources, how they would, um, you know, protect uh, the high seas, the, the resources of the high seas, that is, all state parties, uh, you know, would cooperate towards conservation of living resources in the high seas, whether it's with respect to fishing, mining, or whatever, they would take, uh, you know, international minimum standards would be adopted for the purpose of protection and conservation of the resources in the high seas. And 120 talks about the protection of marine mammals, which I've already referred to earlier. There's the marine mammals in the high seas. And lastly, 100, 100 to 108 deals with piracy, which, of course, we will go through in detail in the next chapter. So this is all about the high seas. And these are the articles. An important part of it is, of course, the right of hot pursuit. And uh, how, like, what, uh, what are the protocols in case of collision? how inquiries are conducted and every state must carry the flag, uh, sorry, every ship must carry the flag of the, uh, you know, the country that it belongs to. And 87 is the foundational chapter of, uh, you know, foundational article of um, chapter seven of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. So do you have any questions? I will repeat uh, if anything you have not understood or or we can do one thing. You can go through these, uh, you know, uh, the notes for this particular chapter and ask me questions if you have for the next class. Or you want me to repeat something now, I'll repeat it now.